On this episode of China Unscripted, has China killed free speech in Australia? Australian Senate candidate Drew Pavlou was arrested for criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. How deep is the CCP's influence in Australia? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Kanesta. And joining us today is Drew Pavlou. He's running for the Australian Senate as a member of the Democratic Alliance Party. And he's an outspoken critic of the Chinese regime. Drew, it's great to have you back on the show. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. I very much appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, so, you know, you were just arrested in Australia, mind you, for uh, criticizing the head of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, why, why don't you tell us what happened? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's been a wild ride these past few years. I think the last time we spoke, um, I was battling expulsion from my university mm -hmm. because I had um, I challenged the university authorities about their relationship with the Chinese government. And they had... Um, basically gone all out in an effort to expel me. Um, they spent about half a million dollars trying to expel me. They brought in the top law firms in Australia. Um, there was a, there was ultimately a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, it, it was a it was a big fracas. So I think that was the last time we spoke mm -hmm. um, where yeah. I basically was almost, almost thrown out of university for life because of um, my criticism of the Chinese Communist Party in Australia. And um, I mean, in the intervening period, I've, I've continued my activism and my campaigning against the CCP um, I even went to Ukraine recently to deliver food and aid supplies to refugees. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So I've been continuing a lot of my work, um, you know, fighting against dictatorship and tyranny. And um, I've been running as a candidate at the upcoming Australian election. We formed a party called Democratic Alliance. And it's almost like a multi-alliance party because we've got the first um, Tibetan candidates running in Australia, first Uyghur candidates, I think, ever to run anywhere in a democratic election in the West. Um, we've got a Hong Kong freedom fighter running as well, Max Locke. Um, so we've got this sort of milk tea alliance. And um, our, our key issue is trying to combat CCP interference in Australia, trying to um, raise awareness about crimes against humanity in China, speak up for these groups that have been persecuted brutally. I mean, it's a very important issue in Australia because it's our top trading partner and people feel it very, um, very intensely, the... the um, the intimidation that the Chinese government tries to use against Australia. I mean, last year, um, they, the Chinese government issued a list of 14 demands against Australia. Basically, they were demanding that we become a vassal state. Otherwise, we would face economic warfare. And they were demanding that we shut down the free press in Australia when it criticised the Chinese government. They were demanding the shutdown of independent think tanks and, you know, university departments that were critical of the CCP. And when the, when the Australian government obviously just rejected that outright, um, the Chinese government's response was to basically wage economic warfare against Australia, where they levelled unilateral sanctions against a range of Australian in industries. A lot of Australians had their, you know, livelihoods wiped out as a result of that. And it was just basically, but it was basically a capricious move by the Chinese Communist Party, where they were just trying to bully Australia into submission. So because we had the temerity to stand up to them on the COVID pandemic, asking for a free investigation, um, a free inquiry into what happened, the release. I mean, the the beginning of the pandemic, how it how it started, how it um how it spread from Wuhan. Because we had the temerity to you know back an international inquiry into that, the Chinese government basically waged economic warfare against Australia. And so it is increasingly a very big issue in Australia. We've been the canary in the coal mine a bit um, when it comes to CCP interference. Australia is really at the front line. Um, Australia and New Zealand is where the CCP first tried to use a lot of its united front tactics. It, it's where it first pioneered a lot of its um, methods by which it has tried to subvert democracies, the West, Western democracies, um, you know, buying up industries, buying off the um, buying off local elites, um, co-opting elites. I mean, we've seen in America now the co-opting of Hollywood, the co-opting of Wall Street. So what we what we're seeing in America, I mean, it started really, I think, in Australia. This is where the Chinese government has really pioneered a lot of these tactics. And that's why it is this international issue, why it is so important to Australia. That's why I'm running. No, we were in Australia in 2018 and we saw a lot of this. Do you think it's getting worse since then? It's hard to say because on one level, the, the liberal government, Scott Morrison, um, has been quite, you know, strong in his rhetoric, standing up to a Chinese government bullying, etc., but on another level, I mean, sometimes the actions don't match the rhetoric. So, for example, Scott Morrison speaks a very, very tough game on the CCP. 
and he's attacked the Labour Party opposition very strongly and harshly for, um, you know, members of the Labour He's, he's attacked Labour MPs very strongly and harshly over some of their ties to the Chinese Communist Party. And yet he has ignored that same issue in his own party. Scott Morrison talks very, very tough on China. And yet it was his government that greenlit the sale of the Port of Darwin, this key piece of critical national security infra- infrastructure. His government, I mean, the Liberal government, greenlit the sale of the Port of Darwin to a Chinese state-backed company. Um, I mean, just what that means on a national security level is just... Um, Incredible. I mean, selling off key pieces of national security infrastructure, the port of Darwin. I mean, there are U.S. troops stationed in the Northern Territory, our ally, and they've sold off the port of Darwin to a Chinese government state-backed company. So, and it's that's not the only one. I mean, they sold off massive sections of the port of Newcastle, which is the largest coal exporting port in the entire world. They sold off a section of the port of Melbourne. So key pieces of national security infrastructure have been sold off um, massive sections of Australian land, Pastoral land, um, massive tracts of Australian water, etc., have been sold off. Um, Chinese state-backed companies have bought massive cotton, have bought up massive cotton farms, and these cotton farms are environmentally destructive. They drain a lot of the um, Murray Darling Basin. It's been um, e- ecolo- ecologically devastating to massive parts of the Australian continent. And so, you know, the government talks very, very tough on China, and yet, on the other hand. They allow this basically pillaging to occur. They allow the Chinese government to just come in and just buy up massive sections of Australian land. In Tasmania recently, we were protesting because the Tarkine rainforest, which is this pristine ancient rainforest, some of these trees, you know, date back thousands upon thousands of years. And um, the Liberal government in Australia has allowed a Chinese state-backed company to come in and um, buy up an Australian mine. And um, they want to build a tailings dam so basically bury um, about the the rough size of the, the tailings dam would be about 300 football pitches. They want to bury about 300 football pitches worth of pristine ancient Australian rainforest in Tasmania. Some of the most beautiful, untouched, pristine wilderness in the world. They want to bury it under a lake of toxic sludge. They're doing and, that um, in Tasmania? The devils. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, like Tasmania, I, I get your point. I mean, that's, that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is good one. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, oh, oh uh, real, real quick. I just want to clarify for, for our American audiences. Uh, in Australia, the Liberal Party is the con- what we would call the Conservative Party, and the Labor Party is what we would consider the more Liberal Party. It would be our Democratic Dem- Party. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is, that's a rough approximation. I, I agree. And, and I mean, it, it's a problem because I think both major parties, to an extent, have been co-opted by massive flows of Chinese donations, Chinese um, business money. I mean, both major parties have had scandals where their MPs have been placed under ASIO investigation. So the Labour Party infamously had the Sam Dastyari scandal where this really prominent Labour politician um, basically changed his position on the South China Sea um, in return for donations from Huang Xiaomo, this huge Chinese government-backed oligarch um, who came to Australia, started buying up massive tracts of Australian pop- property, Australian land, um, so Labor Party had that infamous massive scandal. Um, the Liberal Party, Gladys Liu, this is a Liberal MP that we've been campaigning a lot at this election, and Gladys Liu has basically been placed under ASIO investigation in the past because um, money she has donated, she has sourced for the Liberal Party, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been flagged by ASIO as massive national security threats due to, like, you know, Chinese government influence. She's been spotted next to, I mean, she's been photographed next to men who've been shown to be Chinese spies, She's been photographed next to a guy who came out. He said that the Chinese government offered him a million dollars to infiltrate the Australian parliament. He wound up dead in a Melbourne hotel room under suspicious circumstances. Gladys Liu was photographed at a fundraiser at her home next to this man sitting next to her. I mean, she's she's been placed under ASIO investigation in the past. She was the chair of United Front Bodies. She was members. She was a member of these organisations for a very long time. She was the chair of these organisations. And on live national television, um, she refused to call Xi Jinping a dictator. So when she was pressed about her links to the United Front, she said that she didn't remember. She didn't recall this decades long association. And then when she was pressed about whether she would, you know, criticize Xi Jinping, whether she would say he's a dictator, she said, oh, no, he's not. He's not a dictator in their system. He's an elected chairman. Wow. Wow. This is imagine, you know, a Republican uh, congressman or senator. I mean, 
saying something like that in America. He, she was actually being interviewed by Sky News, which is like, I guess, the Australian equivalent of Fox News. So imagine a Republican congressman or senator going on Fox News and being pressed is Xi Jinping a dictator? And they respond, well, he's an elected chairman in their system. We, we actually kind just, of had that. I yep. mean, when, when Michael Bloomberg, who was running for president as a Democrat, he was like, oh, Xi Jinping's not a dictator. He's got constituents he's got to please. It's like, yeah, but he's a dictator. But of yeah, course, he, I mean, he, didn't, he didn't actually win. I mean, he was mayor of New York for, oh. for 12 years, but he didn't, uh, he didn't win the, the, the Democratic primary. But yeah, I mean, we've had that. And, 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 but yeah. he wasn't under investigation from the FBI, which is kind of the equivalent of, of uh, ASIO. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Gladys Liu has been under ASIO investigation multiple times because of her ties to the Chinese Communist Party, because of her links to people who've been proven to be CCP agents. And, you know, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, I mean, you know, the Liberal Prime Minister, even today, as we're filming this, he was campaigning in her seat, trying to save her seat. And so um, that's where we organised the Kim Jong-un impersonator to uh, go into and crash their press conference and just sort of say, you know, thank you, Gladys Liu, for supporting my friend Xi Jinping. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Gladys Liu, basically. And uh, that was big now in Australia today. So we've been sort of adopting very asymmetric tactics, very uh, insurgent-based tactics to kind of get our message across because we're such a young party we're so small, we don't have big resources of the major parties. And so we just have to like, you know, think outside the box, ways to get our cause attention so that people, you know, wake up to the threat of CCP interference. So people think about the fact that our largest trading partner has a million Muslims in concentration camps solely because of their, you know, religion. I mean, to me, it should be a front page issue every single day that Australia's largest trading partner to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars is carrying out the largest incarceration of an ethnic group based on religious status since the Holocaust. That should be front page news in Australia. That should be a key election issue. It does seem like you have been getting a lot of press lately because of, uh, you know, uh, your very, I don't want to call them publicity stunts, but uh, you're very, you're very clever <laughs> your ways asymmetric to- asymmetric tactics. Insurgency, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Um, well, well, that's, that's the, um, I mean, that's the interesting thing. So I've been campaigning now for like 11, 12 months. I think I announced that I was going to run like back in May. So almost a whole year I've been running now. And um, I mean, this is really the first time we're getting real traction, which is a week out from the election. I mean, if you wanted to time it well, I mean, that's a good time to start getting some media traction. But for a long, long time, like 11 months, basically, uh, you know, we had two, three articles, despite the fact that what we're doing is quite historic. I mean, I'm the youngest person to form a political party in Australian history. We've got the first Uyghurs to run anywhere in the entire world uh, for election in a democratic country. We've got the first Tibetan Australian running for parliament. She's a refugee. She was born in a Tibetan refugee camp. We've got a Hong Kong, a freedom fighter who, you know, left Hong Kong in exile to escape torture. He had friends that were tortured. He was a frontliner. He helped make Molotov cocktails. He's he's part of our party. I mean, what we're doing is really quite unique and it's quite interesting. I mean, sometimes we've had more international press coverage than even in Australia. Like we had, for example, uh, I think it's Zaitong, like the top Swiss paper, do a profile on our party. And then meanwhile, no one in Australia was profiling our party. So Swiss newspapers were interested, but not our own press. And I think I think they didn't want to really cover us because, I mean, one, they just sort of write us off automatically because, oh, they're young and they don't have millions of dollars behind them. Therefore, why cover them? I mean, but on another level, it's almost like they don't want someone to come through um, that they can't control, that they can't, you know, browbeat into submission. Because for three years now, I've been doing this. I've weathered threats. I put my future on the line. They basically tried to, you know, take away my education. I almost lost my entire future there. I've had death threats against my family. There have been times where I was almost made homeless because of the death threats against my family. I didn't, my family didn't want me to be living at home and I didn't have any money to my name. So, I mean, I was almost made homeless at a certain point. I had to weather, you know, losing friends, losing loved ones, you know, losing people I really loved because of the threats. People didn't want to be associated with me, even people who were close friends for a long time. And so, I've weathered a lot over the past couple of years. I've really shown, I think, just through my conduct over the past like three years, that when it comes to sending in CCP interference, I'm someone who will never back down. I mean, I, I helped organise the Peng Shui t-shirts at the Australian, Australian uh, Open, where we basically uh, challenged the Australian Open when they tried to ban any criticism of the CCP on the, on the court. Um, Didn't they try to arrest you for that too? It's crazy. I, I've 
been threatened with arrest so many times. I've been threatened with um, defamation lawsuits designed to threaten me with bankruptcy. Um, I've even been threatened with jail time at a certain point in in my battle with the University of Queensland when I was trying to reveal information about the university's um, corrupt relationship with the Chinese government. Um, the university threatened to take me to court for contempt of court, which carries a three-year prison sentence in my state. So they've threatened me with jail time. They've threatened me with bankruptcy actions, like huge. They've threatened me with huge defamation lawsuits, which would bankrupt me because, man, I'm 22 years old. I've got no assets. I've got no money to my name. Um, yeah, been threatened with arrest. I've actually been arrested recently. I've been assaulted multiple times by supporters of the Chinese government on Australian streets. Um, I've weathered threats. The Chinese government actually singled me out by name a couple times, criticizing me. For example, Zhao Lijian, the spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, he called me. Um, I mean, he accused me of taking money from Taiwan to spread lies and hatred about China. I was very jealous about that. That's, that's <laughs> hilarious. You're <laughs> not only backed by, you know, the CIA or whatever, but then ha Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, so actually, Drew, can you, can you tell us about the, uh, the, when you were arrested about a week ago? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, that's a new escalation in this whole, I mean, free speech crisis, I think, in Australia. Basically, we've got a candidate in the seat of Benelong, which is in Sydney's northwest. Um, Kim Zong Dong Dudu, she's, Kim Zong Dong Dudu, she's the first Tibetan Australian to run for parliament. Um, it's a very diverse seat. There's a large Taiwanese population, large Chinese population, large Hong Kong population, etc. Um, and people have accused us of racism because we're pr protesting against the CCP in the seat. But, I mean, that's just a complete lie because that's conflating all Chinese Australians with the CCP. That is a complete lie. I mean, so many Chinese Australians came out to Australia after Tiananmen Square, like, want, like came to Australia fleeing dictatorship, wanting to live in a... Came to Australia fleeing dictatorship, um, wanting to live in a free democratic country. Um, so, you know, th there are huge parts of the Chinese Australian community that are pro-democracy, that are very critical of the CCP, and we were protesting on their behalf because there's so many times in Australia where I've been, you know, approached by Chinese Australians who say, oh, thank you for what you're doing, Drew. Like, I really wish I could support you, but I'm scared personally to join your protest, etc." I mean, there is a real level of intimidation and fear. I've had Chinese Australian friends have, I've, I've seen Chinese Australian friends, um, I mean, intimidated by the Chinese government, Chinese Australian friends who faced, you know, cars idling outside their houses every day for weeks on end. I've had Chinese Australian friends and Hong Kong Australian friends who were chased down the street and attacked by Chinese government supporters. Like they left their home and they had men waiting for them. Um, I've seen Chinese Australian friends um, have their family members back home contacted by Chinese secu secret police, security police, um, intimidated. Like multiple Chinese Australian friends, like if they've been pictured next to me joining my protests or even at one point my emails were hacked and a Uyghur Australian friend who I was talking with over email um, he was discussing, like, the intimidation his family had faced. Um, we found out that my email had been hacked by a Chinese IP address. And um, three days after my email was hacked, his mother in Xinjiang was actually, Xinjiang or East Turkestan, was um, was taken to the camps by secret police. And I think it was, wow. we, we think it was a because of, because of the fact that he was speaking to me in Australia. Mm, we yeah. had, we've. We face that. I mean, it's it's terrible the level of intimidation that goes on. And when I had that Uyghur Australian friend who lost a mother potentially because he was talking to me, that was something that hit me so hard. I mean, I couldn't sleep for days on end. I felt sick. Um, that one almost destroyed me, you know. And I only kept going because my Uyghur Australian friends, including him, were like, "Keep going," because you know the Chinese government is trying to do this to 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 mess with our heads. They they want us. They want to do this to silence us. Please keep going. And I had to keep going. But it was such a dark thing. And so the, the reason I bring this all up is to make clear, you know, when we protest in Australia against the CCP and we, when we protest in an area that, you know, has a large Taiwanese, Hong Kong or Chinese population, we're protesting on behalf of those who are silenced, who are intimidated, who are threatened by the CCP. We're protesting to try and, you know, give a voice to those people who are threatened. And so I went out to Eastwood, which is, you know, one of these very diverse suburbs. I was with our candidate, Kim Zong Dongdu. This shopping centre we were at, it was like the main thoroughfare in the seat. So all the other candidates were campaigning there, like the Labour and Liberal candidates. And so we went there to campaign as well. And, um, you know, a Taiwanese friend was with me, a Hong Kong friend was with me, Tibetans as well. And they, my Taiwanese friend wrote on a sign, basically, F Xi Jinping, and, we'll, and was like, let's hold this up, you know, just as, a, just as an expression of, like, as an expression of defiance in the face of censorship, 
as a way to express our belief in free speech um, in the face of intimidation and you know threats. Let's let's in, let's protest against the CCP and Xi Jinping personally. You know, in the heart of Sydney. And so I went out and did it. My Taiwanese friend wrote in characters on the sign F Xi Jinping and um, went out and protested. Obviously, I was completely peaceful. I wasn't insulting anyone directly. It wasn't a racist sign against Chinese Australians by any means. It was a protest sign that was directly targeted at Xi Jinping only, a brutal dictator who's never been elected by the Chinese people. And I held up the sign that said F Xi Jinping. And within two minutes, we were surrounded by like really, really you know, aggressive supporters of the Chinese government, basically a, a crowd of about 50, 60 people formed, and there were about five or six, maybe three or four, sorry, three or four guys, um, Chinese government supporters who were like, who were there and they were really aggressive to the point of violence. And so an independent protest journalist, a guy who was just filming the protest, um, one of these Chinese government supporters came up behind him, um, you know, put him in a bear hug, was crushing his ribs, tried to grab his camera and smash it on the ground. And then at that point after that, they came up to me, they motioned like they're about to hit me, um, and then they grabbed my sign, ripped it in half, stomped on it on the ground. And the whole time they were swearing and um, and chanting at us and, and they were calling us, they were calling me like white pig, white monkey. They were hurling racial slurs at my Taiwanese friend. They were calling her rotten banana, meaning yellow on the outside, white on the inside. These really, really sick racial slurs. They were, they were directing towards, um, they were directing these really sick racial slurs against you know, the Taiwanese, Hong Konger supporters that were with us. And um, and they kept on, like, motioning, like, like multiple times they got up in my space, they were, they were about to hit me sort of thing. And I had my hand – I actually, at that point, I put my hands behind my back and I was like, you know, I'm completely peaceful. If you're going to hit me, hit me. Like, basically, just I, – I was trying to show that I wouldn't be intimidated by these thugs. And then the police came. But for some reason, the police didn't go uh, to protect us. I mean, the police, when they came, it was almost immediately like they were there to – go after me. So the guy who attacked me and attacked the cameraman and um, in broad daylight, 50 people watching in the middle of Sydney, people filming broad daylight, attacking people. Um, they didn't arrest him there. Ultimately they did charge him after a massive public outcry, but they didn't arrest him. Um, meanwhile, like, you know, they, they were trying to like intimidate me sort of thing. They, they got me to come to the station, give a statement. I made a statement about the violence attack that we received, said we will press charges against the guy who assaulted us. And um, the, the police, they, they wanted me to give a statement, and, and I gave a statement um, about the assault. So were you, were, you, were you arrested, or did they just invite you to come to the station right now? Um, not at that point, but they wanted me to go into the station. And so at that point, I thought everything was fine. I thought, surely the police will see that I was a peaceful protester, and the, you know all the violence was coming from the pro-CCP crowd, Surely they're going to be trying to protect us. And so I gave that statement in good faith, etc. Then the next day I was about to go home back to Brisbane, my hometown, and um, I was about to get to the airport and I got called up by the detective and he was like, oh, I need you to come back in to discuss your statement. And I was like, why do you need me to come back in? I've already given you my statement. I, and I, I sort of had a bit of a intuition. I was like, uh, are you like looking at my sign? Are you, are you going to be looking at charging me too? Because by that point it had gone super viral. I posted up the footage. And it had gotten like a million views, which is like, you know, I, I didn't expect it to go that viral. No way. And um, and there were a lot of pro-CCP guys who like were inciting violence on Twitter. They were posting up, say, my family's addresses. Um, they were trying to encourage people to attack my parents. There were people sending death threats, um, saying that I deserve to be bashed. And um, and some of them were saying Drew, they didn't go far enough in bashing me, etc. And a lot of them were also like tagging New South Wales police. Like, for example, some pro some pro CCP um, propagandists, state media propagandists, um, edited together footage to make it appear that I had targeted Chinese Australians by race, etc. Like, really, really maliciously splicing together footage to try and use this propaganda ex against me, etc. And then they posted this stuff up saying, "Here's proof that Drew wasn't insulting Xi Jinping; he was trying to insult all Chinese people." And then they were tagging New South Wales police saying, "Charge Drew." And so the next day, yeah, the, the detective called me up and he said, like, you know, come back into the station. I want to talk about your statement. And I was and I was on the way to the airport. I said, why do you need me to come back in? I thought he, maybe he wanted to talk about the sign. Whether he, I was thinking maybe he wanted to um, charge me with, like, offensive language or something like that. And so I said, like, you know, I was a peaceful protest. Are you looking at trying to charge me? And he said, oh, well, you better have a lawyer. Like, who's your lawyer? We'll talk through him. And so 
Um, I ended up talking to my lawyer and, and he thought it was really, really dodgy how New South Wales police were trying to basically, at first they were trying to get me to go into the station um, without a lawyer present on the pretext of discussing my statement. But it's clear now that they wanted to arrest me or, or charge me over the sign. So they were trying to deceive me into going back to the station. Um, my lawyer wrote to them. He said, I will um, I will be taking immediate high court action for to defend Drew's freedom of speech if, if he's charged. Um, and the and the New South Wales police detectives wrote back saying, uh, we will inform you the second our investigation is finished. Drew's not necessarily going to be charged. And and so all this intimidation was was taking place. And I thought, I thought this was so bad for free speech in this country. So I said, okay, I'm going to go back the next week. I'm going to put up a sign. This time I'm not going to have a swear word on it. I'll just say free Hong Kong, free Uyghurs, free Tibetans, down with the CCP. A very simple message that people can't misinterpret. People can't maliciously try and, uh, you know, distort to, to try to smear me. I will just have a very simple message with um, that no one can ever say is racist. Um, and so I went back the next week and uh, we were joined by Hong Kongers, Tibetans, Hong, uh, Hong Kongers, Tibetans, Uyghurs, Chinese pro-democracy supporters. And um, actually, they were the most vocal this week. I mean, um, I sort of took a bit of a back seat. I had a sign, as I said, yeah, no profanities. They were the ones who were mostly leading the, the protest. Uh, Hong Kongers were chanting uh, free, free Hong Kong and pro-democracy slogans in Cantonese. Uh, Chinese pro-democracy supporters were chanting stuff about Tiananmen and st- chanting stuff about pro-democracy. Um, chanting stuff about democracy in Mandarin. It was at that point, suddenly everything got, everything kicked off. Um, there were about 20, 30 police watching us because they, they, I guess they were trying to stop the violence from the week before occurring again. Um, suddenly, but they, they hadn't intervened because we were very peaceful in the second follow-up protest and I was actually a lot more quieter as well, believe it or not. Um, basically, basically um, these pro CCP supporters came again and they started ch- like yelling stuff in Mandarin at the pro-democracy Chinese speakers um, in our crowd. And obviously I don't speak Chinese, so I couldn't join in that, you know, debut. I couldn't join in that fracas. I just was standing up off to the side. I was chanting free Hong Kong with at my, with this, with the poster. And then that's when the police brought me aside. And I guess they were trying to intimidate me into going home. They sort of like, they, they officially gave me the charge sheet for the week before offensive language saying, you've got a court date. We're charging you with this, etc. cetera. Um, you've, you've, used offensive language, um, you've like disturbed the public peace, etc. I, I was saying, am I under arrest? Because they weren't letting me leave, but they, but I was saying, am I under arrest? And they, they were saying, you're not under arrest, but they wouldn't let me leave. The whole thing was just really weird. My friend Kintum started filming. They eventually left me, let me leave with the sort of court slip, the charge sheet, and I sort of tried to rejoin my friends who were just again, still trying to chant pro-democracy stuff against these CCP supporters who were getting really aggressive and getting in people's face. I was completely peaceful. I was standing off to the side. I wasn't getting near anything. I mean, I wasn't violent by any means. And then that's when the police came back to me. And then they said, we're giving you a formal move on order because the protest is now um, causing fear and alarm amongst the public and there's the risk of violent escalation. And I'm like, well, we're completely peaceful. There's only people who are, you know, threatening people and causing fear and alarm are the pro CCP supporters. Um, but I mean, this is, this is the, this is the uh, hypocrisy that we're trying to call out. I mean, the New South Wales police, apparently if you hold a peaceful pro democracy protest in the middle of Sydney and CCP supporters come in and they're aggressive and they're violent and they attack people, the New South Wales police will just shut down your organize your demonstration. They won't try and protect you. They won't try and protect your right to freedom of expression. They'll just say, Oh, because of the risk of violence from the pro CCP supporters, you have to go home. You have to shut everything down. You have yeah, to shut go up with people down. breaking the law. Yeah, this is this is yeah, reminds exactly. me of this uh, this protest I um, I went to, to 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 film, and it was it was an anti uh, President Trump protest. This was a couple of years ago yeah. in front of Trump Tower in Lower Manhattan, uh, and there were like uh, about a dozen uniformed police officers there, you know, to protect. The uh, the protesters who were anti anti President Trump it, in uh, Australia could you do a protest legally that said you know f Scott Morrison of course of course so that's that's the thing that I I pointed out so like I I gave media interviews after and and people were saying well weren't you being provocative and I was like well you go to any progressive rally you go to you know climate rallies etc you see so many young people with signs that say f scott morrison f the prime minister 
and no one ever no one ever is getting arrested for that no one's getting you know no one's facing the risk of getting bashed etc and they shouldn't i mean i believe in freedom of expression in a democratic country we should be able to insult our leaders and australia we've got a tradition a culture where you know we're quite irreverent we we have this sort of larrikin streak to us where you know we're not afraid to you know mock and take the piss out of our leaders and we use coarse language and you know we we you know no one's ever accused the strains of um of, of uh, being polite you know, being yeah exactly exactly <laughs> That's what i was trying to say and, and i mean you walk down the street i mean so many times you know it's an election campaign right now and so many times on the television like the journalists will go down the street and they'll try and do vox pops with citizens like you know what do you think about the prime minister and like every fourth or fifth person will just go, ah, he's a dickhead and like just insult him or even use swear words and they bleep it out. But no one's getting arrested. No one's no one's facing threats. No one's getting bashed. And they shouldn't. I mean, in Australia, we believe in the right to freedom of expression. You should be able to insult a political leader. You should be able to, you know, offend a political leader. I mean, this is a guy with a million people in concentration camps. Why is it OK to, you know, say F Scott Morrison, but well, there's a, there's a very simple answer to that, Drew. You see, it's okay to insult your elected leaders, but Xi Jinping isn't elected. So it's not okay to insult mm. him. Loophole. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's almost like they're treating him like this sacred cow. And my whole point is he shouldn't be a sacred cow. This is a dictator with a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, a dictator who's presided over, you know, forced organ harvesting of prisoners, um, brutal persecution of the Falun Gong, brutal persecution of Tibetans, brutal persecution in Hong Kong, continues every almost every couple of weeks to threaten an invasion of Taiwan. This is a brutal, brutal dictatorship. And suddenly I'm the I'm the I'm the person causing offense because I insult this leader. No, people need to have some perspective and realize, you know, the, the person we should be outraged at is Xi Jinping, the man who's carrying out crimes against humanity on a massive scale. That's my point. And the police basically gave me a move on order. They said Unless you unless you shut down everything, unless you go home, you're going to get arrested. And I just said, listen, I believe in the right to freedom of speech. This is a conscience issue for me. I'm not going to resist arrest. But, you know, with respect, officer, you know, you're going to have to arrest me because I believe in freedom of speech. And, um, and they're like, OK, we will. And then they read out my rights. They didn't handcuff me because, like, as I said, man, I'm, I was not res resisting arrest whatsoever. I was no violent threat whatsoever. I mean, I literally was just standing there with a with a sign. Um, they took me over, put me in the paddy wagon. I got put in like this sort of steel cage at the back of the police wagon and they drove me over to um, the, the local police station, fingerprinted me, got mug shots done. Um, they wanted to do an interview without my lawyer present. I was like, no, nah, not doing that. Um, and then like I was there for like five hours. It was very cold. I was in like this steel cage sort of thing. And then like eventually they bailed me at like midnight, but like, that the bail conditions were really ridiculous. They were saying you can't go back to Eastwood, you can't go back to this area where you're protesting, um, otherwise you'll be ar immediately arrested and actually held in jail. And obviously I didn't have a lawyer present. It was midnight. I was cold, tired, hungry. I just wanted to go home, so I just signed the bail forms. But They didn't feed you or give you any kind of accommodations? Look, I, I, I'm not going to say I was mistreated. I mean, like I was actually very lucky that the police officer, some of the police officers I think actually were sympathetic to me and my cause. I think they were like, why have we arrested this guy? Why did the sergeant in charge like put him in a steel cage like when he's not doing anything wrong? So some of them were offering me like coffee and tea and they were letting they let me read books I had in my bag when I got arrested, which like, thank God, man, because I was so bored. I wasn't allowed to connect with the outside world. I was only allowed one phone call to my dad and he was like so mad at me. He was like, <laughs> what the hell's happening? Was, like, <laughs> and, um, and it was like, it was like it was like 11 p.m. It was really close to midnight, and he that was my one phone call, and he was so mad at me. And they don't let you go on their phone, and you can't talk to anyone really. And so, and I couldn't reach my lawyer because he was asleep. You know, it's Saturday night, nearly midnight, and so I was so bored. Thank God they let me read those books, man. I would have been. I don't know how you'd do it like five hours in a steel cell without anything to do, just with your own thoughts. I was, I was like towards the end, it was pretty pretty terrible, and I thought. Yeah, I don't want to like you know necessarily go to get in this situation again. But to me, this is about so much more than you know just one or two one protest. It's more than just a sign, etc. Like this is about freedom of expression. This is about such a fundamental value that underpins democratic society. And I mean, in Australia, we don't have a bill of rights. We don't have freedom of speech it's explicitly protected in our constitution. The High Court has found in the past um, there's an implied right to freedom of speech in the constitution because like 
the constitution sets out that we are a democracy and the high court justices were like, well, you can't have a democracy without some level of freedom of speech. But because it's not explicitly in there, I mean, it's quite, it's quite, you know, there's, there are gray areas. I mean, things like offending a political leader. I mean, is that covered by free speech? And obviously in my case, it wasn't because they arrested me and like they've, they've got a court date for me now. They, etc. So, so our current hope is, I'm very lucky. I've got one of the best barristers in Australia working for me. One of the best lawyers um, who's made a QC, which is like in Australia, when you're made a silk, um, means you're in the basically like top 10% of barristers. And um, he was like the youngest person made a silk in the 20th century in the entire Commonwealth. So I'm very lucky. I've got one of the best barristers in the country, Tony Morris QC. And um, and Tony, he's representing me for free. And he's, he's said to the New South Wales Police Force, um, we want... Uh, a complete change to Drew's bail conditions. Uh, there should be no restrictions on him campaigning in the suburb of Eastwood alongside his fellow candidate, Kim Zong Dong Du, as part of the election campaign. Because that's the another thing, man. Like, I mean, one thing to get arrested as a protester, which is really bad, but another thing, I'm actually running for election. I'm campaigning in the seat with our candidate in the, like, in the election. I mean, I think, I don't know how many times it's occurred where a Senate candidate, someone running for office in Australia, has been arrested in the course of campaigning because of something they put on a sign. I don't know if it's, if it's probably, it's potentially unprecedented. So we think it's like, potential, it's got the potential to be this big um, precedent setting case where, I mean, if we win, if we go to the High Court and we um, we can get a change to my bail conditions, et cetera, and, and the High Court can rule that I was, you know, unfairly treated, et cetera. Um, then it could be a precedent-setting case that may expand the scope of free speech. Um, and that's what I really hope to happen. I mean, I, I believe so fundamentally in the right to freedom of speech, and I've faced a lot of threats and attacks over the past couple of years because of criticism I've, of criticism I've made of this dictatorship. And um, I know in a, obviously in China there's no such thing as freedom of speech. If you criticise Xi Jinping of China, you'll end up in a ditch. And we're, we believe we've... I mean, in a democracy like Australia, we should be able to speak out freely without anything like that ever happening to us. Um, and I'm not saying it's anywhere analogous to the situation in China, but it is really concerning how there's this sort of creeping uh, authoritarianism in our in our dem democratic societies, as of, as we've talked about and as your show has said, has covered many times. I mean, look at how Hollywood self-censors, look at how NBA players self-censor just because of the massive power of Chinese money. Yeah, well, in your case, I mean, it, it's, it sounds like it's not just an issue of freedom of speech. It also sounds a little like election interference. Yeah, exactly. It is also potentially like foreign election interference because, I mean, as I said prior as well, there were Chinese state media propagandists who were splicing together basically footage to make out that my protest had been some kind of, you know, hate crime, like just propaganda they were putting out against me. And then they were tagging New South Wales police asking for New South Wales police to arrest me. And, um, you know, these guys, I mean, some of these state media propagandists were based in Shanghai. They're based in China. I mean, like, how's that not foreign election interference? Yeah, I mean, clearly you're on the CCP's radar, and I'm sure they would like, they would, they wouldn't like it if you're elected. Yeah, I mean, I've them personally. I mean, how many 22-year-olds in the world? I mean, obviously you get the really brave Hong Kongers like Joshua Wong, Agnes Chow, et cetera. Um, but, I mean, like, it's not that often that, you know, you know, young people are directly sort of named and shamed by the CCP. And I'm probably the youngest Australian to ever been condemned personally by like Chinese foreign ministry officials in before international press conferences. Did I mention I'm jealous? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, oh, that was, um, that was a great highlight in my life. I, I mean, there was Stop even it. a point. Stop it. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I talked about this on the show with you guys last time, but there was even a point because my family's of Greek Cypriot background, like they came to Australia in the seventies and sixties and seventies and the Chinese ambassador to Cyprus, like wrote a letter to the Chinese press, like an open letter, no, oh, wrote a letter to the Cypriot press, sorry, a, an open letter, like addressed to the public, like basically threatening and going like, you don't want to end up like Joshua Wong drew Pablo. And it's like Joshua Wong, well, yeah, he's been arrested. He's been put in a prison cell. So that's kind of a threat. And then uh, additionally, how crazy is it that, Man, I don't speak Greek. Um, I've only been to Cyprus once in my entire life. My parents were born here in Australia, but just because I'm Greek Cypriot background, my my family's ethnic background, the Chinese ambassador to Cyprus condemns me by name. I mean, I mean, it's such an example of um, you know, their sort of blood and soil fascist kind of mindset where 
men like I, I've always said the Chinese dictatorship right now, it's not really communist. It's basically a fascist dictatorship, I think. It's like an ethno state where it's based on Han supremacy and other minority groups, etc., are seen as inferior. I mean, what a what a weird scenario that like they come out and the Chinese ambassador to Cyprus um, attacks me personally just because my family background is Cypriot. I mean, it's bizarre. It is it is interesting how your uh, kind of diverse political party made up of Tibetans and Uyghurs and Hong Kongers are now being accused of being racist, right, against the Chinese Australians. Is that what's happening? We always get accused of this. Um, and the media sometimes doesn't help my case because when they run a story about me getting arrested, they go, anti-China activist Drew Pavel gets arrested. I'm like, no, I'm not anti-China. And I've said it a million times. I'm, I've never been anti-China. I'm anti-CCP. The CCP and China are not one and the same. That is a propaganda, you know, that's a propaganda tactic that's been propagated by the CCP for years where they try and conflate the Chinese people and the and the party state. That is completely wrong. I mean, when you criticise Scott Morrison in the Australian political context, no one in Australia would ever consider it a racial attack on all Australians. And so, like, like for example, when, when I um, did the sign about, like, saying F Xi Jinping, some of the pro-CCP supporters were like, wow, how would you feel, Drew, if someone went in Cyprus and put up a sign saying, you know, F, G, F Drew Pablo, or and some of them were like, "What? How would you feel, Drew, if someone came, you know, to some someone went in Singapore and they went outside at Australia House in Singapore and they put up a sign saying F Scott Morrison?" I was like, "Man, all these trains there would come out and buy you a beer. Like, no one cares. <laughs> no, one, no one sees it as a. They don't get no it. One, no, no one sees Scott Morrison as the embodiment of the Australian people." We have a democracy. Half of Australians disagree with them. And it's the same in the CC. It's the same in China. It's a one party state, but there are still hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens who've never had a say politically. They don't agree with Xi Jinping. They don't agree with the brutal authoritarian tactics. I mean, look at Shanghai. Look at look at the unrest in Shanghai recently. Like Chinese censors were trying to work overdrive on the Internet to try and censor any criticism of the party because millions of netizens across China were criticizing the, the party state's insane policies on COVID zero. Um, so it's very clear there is dissent in China. There is no such thing as, you know, like it is just absolutely a lie that the Chinese dictatorship embodies the Chinese people. And so unfortunately we've been smeared for so long as anti-China. Um, and it's very sad, a lot of progressives, and it's so, this is something I've never understood. And it's like, it constantly infuriates me. And it's so hard for me personally as well because I actually started off sort of more progressive leaning and I still I still probably lean overall in that direction. But like the way other progressives just smear me and attack me and they go, Drew's a white supremacist, Drew's a fascist because I criticise the Chinese dictatorship. And it's like, I, I, I don't understand it. It's like, I, part of it I think is just like, you know, Trump obviously was very strongly critical of the CCP. He came out very harshly against Xi Jinping, etc. And so it's almost like half of progressives overnight must be like, wow, if Trump opposes it, therefore it must be good. And it's like, like, can people think about more than one thing at once? Like, no, no, <laughs> no. Well, yeah. so, uh, Unfortunately, just, I do yeah. have to say that 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 whole phenomenon is it actually predates Trump. Like, yeah, it predates Trump right. exactly. Yeah. Well, but, but the interesting thing you're you're bringing up the um, the CCP's sort of uh, fascist Han ethno state, uh, and, and the the irony here is that like so so anyone who's like you know Tibetan or Uyghur is obviously um, subjugated and treated unfairly because they're not Han Chinese, right? Like the Uyghurs put in concentration camps, Tibetans, uh, yeah. similar type things, and but but yet they're considered, oh, well, these territories are part of China. So these people are Chinese and they're expected to toe the line. Well, I mean, I think this is also in Western discourse, we have this problem where it seems like uh, some people think that the only people who can be imperialist or colonialist are like white people, essentially. Yeah. So what you're saying, what, Shelley, is that the Chinese Communist Party is... is, is a, like I mean, it's, they're obviously going out and acting pretty imperialist right now. Yeah. I can't believe you said that. Shelley. I know I'm so racist You're so against racist. Chinese people. <laughs> Man, like my Uyghur and Tibetan friends in Australia, they just cannot, un they can't understand this sort of mindset that a lot of like white progressives take to things. Like they just don't understand it. They're like, but we've experienced colonialism. We've experienced imperialism. Why do you just pretend it doesn't exist? Why do you pretend we don't exist? They, they say this to me. One of my Uyghur friends, 
I was having a, a lunch with him and he said this thing that seemed so simple at the time, but I, I still think about it. It was just shocking. He was like, oh, I really, I really loved it when I moved to Australia and I got my ID for the first time because the first time I had an ID in my life that didn't list my racial background on my ID. And I was like, <laughs> whoa. Like, whoa. Like, wow. And I was like, wow. what do you mean? And, oh, in China, like, your, your ID just says weaker. Like, it, it has your race on there. And I was like, wow. and it's just like small things like that. Like, it's shocking to me. And, and yet, like, in some of these, you know, echo chambers, bubbles, like, they just think, yeah, it's impossible for, you know, racial colonialism, imperialism to exist outside of the West. And it's like, and then my weaker friend was like, oh, yeah, when I came to Australia, it felt like such a load lifted off my shoulders. The first time I never had, yeah, my race listed on my government identification papers. And I just go, whoa, like, I didn't even know that's a thing. Like, it's so ignorant on the part of so many people. They don't even care about their stories. They don't even, I mean, some of them don't know Uyghurs and Tibetans exist. Others know that it's happening, but they just ignore it. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Like, there's always this argument about, oh, you know, we need to, we, we should work with China. We can't, uh, you know, uh, antagonize the situation. But really, at the end of the day, what, what always happens is the Chinese Communist Party makes democracies more authoritarian. And I think your case is the perfect example of that. And exactly that thing you just mentioned, like, we've got that problem still here in Australia where even just yesterday it came out that some really high profile independent candidates who look like they're going to be elected to the next parliament, they came out and they were saying stuff like, oh, the government is, so, the Australian government's so arrogant. They haven't extended an olive, olive branch to a China diplomatically. They've talked so stridently about China. They've destroyed the economic relationship. And I'm like, sit, I sit back and I'm like, wow. Okay. So Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton and, you know, government officials in Australia, you know, criticized the Chinese government very harshly. Let's let's consider this the alternate scenario. Let, uh, let's consider they they go out, they extend the olive branch. Apparently, you know, they kowtow, they they pretend that there are no crimes of, against humanity in China. Either way, either way, my Uyghur and Tibetan Tibetan friends, they're still going to have family members who are tortured and persecuted just simply because of their racial background, no matter what an Australian government official says. So, say like those people who say the West is at fault for deteriorating tensions, Australian government has been so offensive in its dealings with China. It's like, no matter what the Australian government says, my Uyghur and Tibetan friends are still going to have family members who, you know, who are political prisoners. I'm, I still have Uyghur friends whose mothers will be in concentration camps because they talk to me in Australia, no matter what the Australian government says. So no matter whether we adopt the kowtow, the diplomatic niceties, we respect all the arbitrary red lines set down by Beijing, regardless of whether or not we do that, the Chinese dictatorship is still going to be an imperialist, fascist, ethno state, and it's that's just the fundamental nature of the regime. No matter what we do in the West, I mean, it's not they haven't adopted the characteristics of a Han supremacist dictatorship because Trump came out and he criticised, you know, China China's COVID policies. They didn't. That's not something that happens overnight. No, re regardless of what we say in the West, regardless of what our governments say or do. That is the fundamental nature of the CCP regime in China. It's not going to change as a result of whether we engage more nicely with them or not. So, I mean, I would say that in a way, engaging with them more nicely just emboldens them, if anything. Yeah, yeah. of course. We need to cut them off. Yeah. So, so you know, your your party, a lot of the people in your party are uh, immigrants, you know, uh, Uyghur, uh, Tibetan, Hong Kong. Uh, why should Australians want to elect them? Yeah, so, so this is the thing. If you want people who understand at a fundamental level the threat and the, the danger that we're dealing with when it comes to the CCP, when it comes to the CCP's dealings with our country, if you want to elect someone who understands just in this, like so deeply, it just in the very core, in the fabric of their being, you know, if you want someone that understands what we're dealing with here when it comes to the CCP's imperialism, its threats to undermine our democracy, its attempts to bully us into submission, its attempts to turn us into a vassal state, then don't vote for the political establishment, the same old politicians who take money from China, who go out and say, oh, we've got to engage with them because they're our largest trade partner. No, vote for people who've actually risked everything. Like, vote for people who have experienced the brutal reality of the Chinese Communist Party. So you can vote for the same old, you know, the same old politicians who will just keep on the, the, keep on the status quo dealings with China. You can, you can vote for the status quo with China where every day our democracy is under more and more strain, 
we are just completely economically tied at the hip with a dictatorship that has just in the past year demanded that we shut down, you know, the free press, shut down independent think tanks and university departments, etc. We can be economically tied at the hip with a dictatorship that wants to destroy our democracy, destroy our democratic way of life, turn us into a vassal state, or we need to approach our dealings with the CCP with clear eyes, no more of the, the old failed engagement policy where, oh, if only we just trade with them a bit more, they'll turn into a thriving liberal democracy. No, we have to have clear eyes when we engage with the dictatorship. And so you can vote for the status quo or you can vote for Tibetans who have had parents and grandparents who were tortured by the Chinese Communist Party. You can vote for Uyghurs who have family members in the concentration camps. You can vote for Hong Kongers who fled into exile because their friends were tortured. You can vote for you know me, for example, who almost lost my education, has been assaulted, arrested, attacked. My family were threatened because I criticised the CCP. We are people who understand um, just because of who we are at a fundamental level. I mean, Kinzum, our Tibetan candidate, she can't wake up tomorrow and change her stance on China because she gets a big, big, you know, bag of money dropped in a letterbox. Mm. She can't do that because in the very core of her being, she was she's a refugee from Tibet. Her homeland was destroyed. Her grandfather died as a political prison in as a political prisoner, you know, tortured by the Chinese government for years upon years. She's not someone who's going to sell out. She's not going to she's not someone who, you know, will sell out our sovereignty, sell out our democratic values, you know, enable the slow boa constrictor type strangulation of our democracy. This isn't going to happen when you vote for the Democratic Alliance, when you vote for Tibetans, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, Australians who faced, you know, brutal persecution. And not saying I faced brutal persecution, but the but the other members of my party have. Because when you vote for people like us who understand the CCP at a fundamental nature, at the fundamental level, because we've all gone through, you know, in, to varying degrees, you know, ordeals when it comes to, you know, standing against the Chinese government, when you vote for us, you know what you're getting. We're not going to sell out Australia. We're not going to sell out democratic values. We're not going to allow our economy to be dominated by Chinese government um, interests. I mean, the Liberal Party, the Labour Party, the Greens, the Independents, to all varying degrees over the years, they've, I mean, the Liberals wanted to introduce an extradition bill. Um, that's what, I mean, Hong Kongers were fighting and dying in the streets trying to stop an extradition bill with, tri with China. The Liberal government in 2013 tried to introduce one. No, actually, I think it was as late as 2016, 2017, like the Liberal government tried to introduce one, an extradition bill in Australia. Um, Labor had Sam Dasiari, who changed his position on the South China Sea because the Labor, because a Chinese government-linked billionaire dropped off a bag full of $100,000 of in cash at this Labor Party headquarters in Sydney. That's a real story. Um, the Greens just last just last week came out and they said Taiwan's not an issue for Australia. Um, it's racist to criticise the Chinese government's attempts to build military bases on the Solomon Islands, just a couple, just a thousand kilometres off the coast of North Queensland. That's racist and colonial mindset to criticise that. They want to halve our defence spending. They want to rip up the relationship with the US, all our defence partners, and they want to halve defence spending. I mean, it's literally the Chinese government's golden dream. They want that. They they would love that to happen yeah. if we cut our defence spending in half and cut off our relationships with democratic allies. I mean, the Chinese government would froth that. The Greens came out just the other day and said that. Um, the independents who, who send a really good chance of getting elected to the next parliament, they were coming out just the other day saying the Australian government's at fault for the deteriorating ties with China. The Australian government's been arrogant for not extending an olive branch. To varying degrees, all these parties, all the other, you know, massive, all the other, you know, electoral groups in Australian democracy have been co-opted. They they try and win over votes in the Chinese Australian community, so they, they fear that they... They feel that they can't criticise the CCP because it, it's a it's a bizarre thing. I mean, the United Front groups are the most vocal and the most loudly, the most vocal, the most the best funded sort of groups um, among the Chinese Australian community, simply because um, the pro democracy groups have been strangled and drowned out, unfairly intimidated, and because these United Front groups come out and and support dictatorship, etc. A lot of the established Australian politicians. They, they think, oh, just in the name of multiculturalism, we, we have to mute our criticism of the Chinese government's massive crimes against humanity. Um, so many Australian politicians as well have just directly taken money, have directly taken basically what amounts to bribes. Um, so, look, if you vote for us, um, we're not going to be taking bribes from the Chinese government. We're not going to be taking brown paper bags full of cash. We're not going to be, you know, having 
fundraisers at the Australia China Business Council at the Australia China Commerce Association, etc. Like, like we've got Tibetans, Hong Kong as Uyghurs, you know, Australians who have faced CCP um, attacks. They're, they're refugees from CCP rule. These people understand the CCP in a fundamental nature. And so if you want people who will stand for Australian democracy, stand for Australian sovereignty, never allow the Chinese government to suffocate us, strangle us into submission, then vote for people who actually understand the CCP, not the, not the failed status quo politicians who just think engagement's the answer, when that policy has been borne out as a massive failure over the past couple of years. And there's one additional reason, of course, people should vote for you, which is that you've been arrested, which makes you a criminal, which actually makes you the most Australian of all. Oh. I'm glad we took that time. <laughs> I believe in free speech, so I'll accept jokes at um, you know the Australian expense because I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to try bash you. I'm not going to you know call for your head because we believe in democracy. We believe in freedom of speech. All right. Well, so Drew, the the election is coming up on May 21st. Uh, for anyone listening who wants to follow you, where should they go? Look, um, follow my social media i'm on facebook twitter instagram i'm even on tiktok where i try and post anti-ccp stuff and i routinely get blocked um it's a that's a good way to try and uh, point out you know limits the freedom of speech as well um so you can follow me on social media um you can follow our other candidates we've got kinzom dongdu the first tibetan australian to ever run for parliament we've got inti alhem the first uyghur to run for parliament adilia mohammed uh, max mock the hong konger uh yeah follow our social medias uh Follow along for the ride. I think it's quite entertaining. We get up to hijinks every day. And um, please follow along for the legal, legal battle. I hope we'll go to the high court and we'll win a big precedent for freedom of speech in this country and hopefully expand the right to freedom of, of speech. Well, thanks for joining us today, Drew, and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it all from one convict to uh, my American friends. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care of yourself. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I think it's just in incredible how so many people are deluded by, uh, like, the whole racist, colonialist, imperialist thing, that they can't recognize what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. Isn't it kind of racist to think that only one race can be ethno-fascist? That's beautiful. Deep down, aren't we all ethno-fascists? I don't like where this is going. <laughs> yeah, suddenly it's it's gotten really bad. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, that's that's, that's the thing. It's uh, pe people people can do bad things no matter who they are. Yeah, regardless of race, someday we'll live in a world where anybody can do terrible things to each other. I think we, we are we already are, living in that world. world. Wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ah, Matt, the optimist. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of shocked to hear how, you know, I think because when we were in Australia in 2018, it was the beginning of the realization, I think, among um, a lot of Australian officials. There were all those ASIO investigations going on. Uh, you know, that's when Clive Hamilton's book on, like, Chinese influence in Australia Silent came invasion. out. Yeah, so there was a growing discourse about this that wasn't happening yet in a lot of other countries that had been deeply compromised yeah. by China, like Canada, well, as, as the as US, Drew said, like Australia is sort of the canary in the coal mine. A lot of things started. A lot of the CCP's tactics I would say, they yeah, in I Taiwan. Would say and Taiwan, then, then Australia and New Zealand, uh -huh. then Canada, then and America. America. America's last because, you know, we're the hardest to defeat. They had to perfect their system first. But yeah, I mean... New Zealand just extradited somebody to China like a couple of weeks ago. It was like, insane. It's, yeah. It's it's not good what's happening. So I no. was I was thinking that maybe Australia was like turning around, you know, but apparently not so much. Yeah. Well, it sounds like all those elements are coming to the front. Yeah. So this at least people be are being more aware of it. But especially the things about like the government being able to sell off all this land to mm -hmm. the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, it sounds like what's happening in, you know, everywhere that the Chinese Communist Party has Belt and Road dealings, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, like China has bought up some amount of American farmland too, not that right. Much, but, but like the the Port of Darwin, which is that's massive, which which is massive, and also because of its location, mm -hmm. and you know, we'll put up a map, but like that location is the port that's really close to China, and so when you give access to Chinese, like, you know, civilian ships, but could then be, 
you know, these quasi gray area maritime militia, what, whatever it kind of ends up being. It'll be great. The, the Chinese troops can stop at their military base on the Solomon Islands and then and go, go down to, to the military base on Darwin. Darwin. Yeah, wow. It's all part of the plan. Yeah. Don't other people get it? Am I the only one who gets it? Well, I mean, Drew gets it. Drew gets it. <laughs> yeah, good good on him for really pushing the envelope and not being intimidated, though. He, he should know. He should always have a lawyer present if he's talking to the police. Uh, I mean, he does have a good lawyer. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately he does. But, uh, you know, just not on midnight on a Saturday, I guess. Well, I was just thinking of like that first time he was brought in in the day. Like he shouldn't have made any statement to the police. I mean, like I can understand like, oh, obviously... They're not going to be going after me. Yes. Because that would be insane. Yeah. Uh, I remember a, a police uh, consultant basically telling people like, like if you get uh, brought into the station to give a statement and you're innocent, still get a lawyer. Like basically there's no reason to ever talk to the police without a lawyer present, period. Even if you, you do believe you're completely innocent. You know what it is? It's all the cop shows. Like, like Drew has this, this amazing story of like he... He, he's not a college dropout. Like he's expelled from college for doing what colleges and universities supposedly encourage people to do, which is stand up to try to make the system better, right? And the, the Australian university spent half a million dollars to, in legal fees or whatever to, to kick him out. Like they could have paid for his tuition. <laughs> paid for a lot of tuitions. Uh, yeah, I mean, like that's incredible. The story began with like his university trying to expel him and now... He's being he's a he's a he's a candidate for Senate and he's being arrested for criticizing the CCP. That is mind boggling. Um, but I mean, fortunately, like, you know, a million people saw that video like it's getting getting press. So I think people do care about the issue. It's just wild, wild times we live in. Uh, well, so. Thank you for joining us to hear about Drew's incredible story. Uh, hey, share it with your friends and family. I mean, yeah, that will benefit the show and get us more clicks and views, but it's for Drew. And, well, no, it's for stopping the Chinese Communist Party. This isn't about me secretly wanting to be mentioned by Jolly Jin. Uh, <laughs> just, just share this with everyone. That undercurrent of jealousy has been running this whole past hour. <laughs> fuming, I've been fuming. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time.